Hello, I'm Richard Chambers, the Senior Internal Audit Advisor for Audit Board, and welcome to another in my continuing series, Agents of Change, that I'm doing on behalf of Audit Board. I am pleased to welcome back for another s session today, Cynthia Cooper. Cynthia is an internationally recognized speaker, consultant, and best-selling author and advocate. She's the CEO of Cooper Group, LLC. Cynthia consults and speaks to audiences around the world on ethics and leadership. In 2020, Cynthia was selected by Time Magazine to be included in 100 Women of the Year, Time's list of the most influential women of the last 100 years. In 2002, she was named one of Time Magazine's Persons of the Year for her role in unraveling and reporting what would become the largest corporate fraud in history at Worldcom. Cynthia, welcome back. It's so good to have you. Uh, thank you for having me back, Richard. Cynthia, since WorldCom, you've been a strong and vocal advocate for uh, ethical decision making and uh, and the importance of integrity and courage in the corporate sector. Uh, you most recently have teamed up with uh, Erica Chung, uh, the whistleblower from Theranos. Can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing together? So um, I'm, I'm continuing. I have my own consulting f uh, firm, Cooper Group, where I continue to to speak and and write. But Erica and I were introduced through the Association of Fraud Examiners. And we've done a number of presentations together, fireside chats, um, and we are now doing some consulting work and also um, doing some whistleblower support work. So if you're a whistleblower, you're often approached by other people who have either been a whistleblower or they're considering becoming a whistleblower. And you know, when I went through my experiences, I had to kind of try to navigate through through that. There was there was no book or or guidance for me, and so Eric and I really want to to be able to share um, our experiences with other whistleblowers or potential whistleblowers, and also connect them, get, provide them with resources that are helpful, help them to set expectations, um, and then connect them with people who might help them walk through the process. Yeah, well, that's. <clears throat> it's very, uh, I think, very selfless, and and it's it's a public service that I think you guys are doing because um, certainly there there have been plenty of cases, and uh, I see it all the time in the public sector uh, with internal auditors who who uh, some somehow they they uh, crossed somebody or s said something about somebody's pet project or whatever, and then they find themselves uh, being fired or being retaliated against, and. I, I've I've always felt the need to go out there and defend them and call out the the government officials and others who make it happen. But but I know this: there's for every one that I know about, there's probably a hundred I don't know about where people yeah. are done the same way, so the same thing happens. So for me, what you guys are doing, it's a great public service, and I, for one, am very grateful that you're doing it. Well, Erica, she has shared with me how much it meant um, for us to be able to connect because I'm 20 years down the road and she was just out of college when she blew the whistle at Theranos. And I felt the same way when I met Sharon Watkins and Colleen Rowley. They were a bit ahead of me. Um, and it was just, y you feel as if you're on this island, right? Um, but when you meet other people who have gone through the same experiences and you realize there's this kind of a whistleblower phenomena, right, um, that if you step into that whistleblower box, you're going to begin to experience a lot of the same things. Right. Um, I think I've mentioned to you before, and you've probably read about what whistleblowers experience, oh, yeah. but, um, you know, not only retaliation, but they often have difficulty finding employment, they often suffer from depression. Um, studies show that their marriages frequently end in divorce and they end up filing bankruptcy. So, you know, real, real difficulties for people who step over that invisible line that sometimes you don't even know exist and speak truth to power. And it's very hard to ever be considered part of the team again. Yeah. So most people who become whistleblowers end up um, leaving their organizations within a year and going in uh, a new or different direction. Yeah. It's it's sad. You know, it's it's true, as I said, in government, a lot of people refer to the auditors as the watchdogs. And as I've often said, everybody loves a watchdog until it barks. 
because it's at that point that they somehow say, hmm, this might not be good for me. And uh, so I think you guys are out there uh, helping people find their voice and more importantly, find themselves after, uh, after those things happen. Yeah, so, I love what you just said about finding your voice. Yeah. Um, I think that's important not only for you know, whistleblowers, but for all, for all of us, right? right. And, and particularly people in internal audit right. um, to find our voice. Even if I think, I believe you wrote, I believe it was you, even if your voice is shaking, is, was there a quote? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, find your voice. Even if even, it's shaking inside. Even if it's shaking inside, yeah. Absolutely. So. You know, WorldCom and Theranos uh, scandals certainly have gotten a lot of attention and for good reason. Uh, but, but on the surface, those two uh, s scandals, they don't have a lot in common. What, what would you say uh, are the comparisons? What, what makes those two uh, stories have some uh, similarities? Yeah, y you're right. There are, I mean, there are, there are some differences, of course. Theranos was an entrepreneurial startup company, private company um, in Silicon Valley. Um, WorldCom started out as an entrepreneurial company and grew very rapidly through acquisition, acquiring other entrepreneurial uh, companies, and of course grew to thirty-eight billion dollars over one hundred thousand employees. So they were on very at very different places on the growth curve. Right. But there were also, I think, some similarities between the two companies as well. So if you look at Theranos and WorldCom, you had situations where um, there was a gap in the case of WorldCom between reality and expectations. And in the case of Theranos, there was a gap between the promises she made and her, or her vision, really, uh, and expectations. And instead of telling the public the truth, right. the executives weren't willing to accept failure in both of those cases. Success so, at any cost, basically. Success at any cost, exactly. And I think, you know, perhaps more than greed in some of these cases, I think pride comes into play as it, people just don't want the company to, to fail on their watch. Yeah. Or at least as much as, much as greed, I think it, it plays a role. So there are similarities and certainly, and I've already alluded to um, Erica and me, we had a lot of similarities in what we experienced as whistleblowers we both uh, received pushback from uh, members of the board of directors and the executive team. Erica went to uh, George Schultz and received some pushback at that level. Mm -hmm. And retaliation in the case of Theranos, pe the, the company hired people to follow her. So, um, you know, very similar. Uh, in terms of what we experienced as whistleblowers. Cynthia, we've talked uh, a lot about um, companies and, and ethics and decision making and all, and a lot of it comes back to culture. Um, how would you describe corporate culture and what advice would you offer CAEs when it comes to assessing or auditing the culture and their organizations? I think, well, I've heard the culture described in a, a number of different ways. and. To a lot of people, I think it's a mystery, right? What, what is culture and how do you assess or audit culture? Um, and I think we need to take the, take the mystery out of it. Um, culture, uh, one definition I've heard is that it's culture is to an organization like per, is personality is to an individual. Mm -hmm. um, I've also heard that it's, it's the glue, really, that holds the organization together, that provides some stability but I would really say that culture is like peeling an onion. There are so many different elements and aspects of a culture from vision to values to tone at the top, even the, the physical location and what, what that's like, just observing um, you know, what the work environment is like. So you have to first you know, identify all of these different elements of a culture. But I'd love to hear your your perspective, how do, you, how do you see culture? How would you define culture within an organization? You know, I've, uh, I've, I've been dealing with this issue of culture now for eight years. I think 2014 is when I first started talking about it. And, and I sort of like very simple definition. There, there's, 
there are all kinds of academic definitions and, and all of culture, but for me, I like the simple one. It's how we do things around here. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, great example is Enron. Enron had the most amazing value uh, posters and and all, but it's you know what it's what you what you do and not what you say. Because when it came down to what was really being done there, it was very very different. Yeah, I, I like that. So that's really I love the definition and and when you you're really not in alignment, right? So right. when the organization professes certain values but they're not living by those values, they're not in alignment. The same right. with us as individuals. That's right. That's right. And so you know when it comes to advice uh, for, for auditors and CAEs about um, how do you audit culture. First of all, if you've never assessed culture, you're f probably going to find yourself underwater pretty quickly. Um, I believe the best way to do it is to start out by looking at culture in every audit you do. Because at the end of the day, we're looking for root causes, right? When we have, right. when we have fi findings, we're looking for root causes, and all too often the root cause lies in culture. It's not, it's not that somebody didn't follow a regulation or a policy. It's because they were incentivized not to follow the policy. They were incentivized for how the, what the ends, not the means. I also think that doing an overall assessment annually can provide tremendous benefits. And mm -hmm. you asked me earlier, you said, I'm sure you've given a lot of thought to WorldCom. And and I have for the past 20 years, not only WorldCom, but all the, I've studied many, many frauds and how they occurred and given a lot of thought to what can we do to prevent frauds and detect them more quickly. So if, if we were to touch everyone in the organization annually through a combination of one-on-one -on -one interviews, roundtable discussions, culture questionnaires, and we ask the right questions, I think some of these issues would fall out early. I think we could detect them much sooner because I think there are people who would raise their hand and say, well, you know, I have been asked, I'm in the sales division and I've been asked to do this. I'm not right. comfortable with it. So I think there's... It starts to surface. Up yeah, I think so. Um, I, and I would love to know, what are you seeing out there or what percent of, of audit departments are assessing either the whole culture or portions of the culture? Well, the last, uh, the last surveys I've seen is that very few do corporate-wide or company-wide audits of culture, but, but increasingly I think uh, culture raises its head as, as, as something that they get into when they're doing individual audits, particularly if they find a repetitive uh, sort of condition um, they, they have to figure out what's really at, at, at the cause here, what's the root yeah. cause, and all too often. And the one common thread I think I find with cultures is that they're, they're, they tend to, the ones that I would call toxic cultures, one of the, the most common uh, characteristics is that they are cultures where the ends justifies the means. It's, it's, yeah. it's that, you know, we have to achieve this performance level or these are your performance metrics and nobody really looks hard at how did you get there. And that to me has, is just repeats itself over and over in some of these cases. Cynthia, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate you sitting down with me and, and having the conversations we've had. I know that our viewers are gonna be, like I am, really riveted at the kind of insights that are being offered. Thank you again so much um, for doing this and for joining me and talking about these important topics. I've loved it. Thank you for inviting me. I hope to continue the conversation.